one day will bow before him. Isn't that good news? <laughs> Woohoo! Yay, God! Yay, God! Um, good morning, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm glad that you uh, came by whatever means it was. Your willingness or being dragged in by your hair, whatever it was, it doesn't even matter. I'm just so glad you're here because I am confident that God has a word for you. And it can be through the songs that we're singing or just feeling the warmth of a neighbor next to you or through his word that's going to be talked about earlier through a message through our pastor from God. So, so welcome. and We're glad you're here. Um, if this is your first time visiting with us, or first time guest, or maybe you've been coming a couple of times, um, we would love to have some information about you, and there is a way that you can give us that information. So in a, a bulletin, I hope you picked one up when you came in. There's a little section in the back, a little perforated section, where you can fill out your information and tear that off of the bulletin. There's a little church house in the foyer with a little slot on top. You can place it in there, and that is one way that we can get some information from you to know about your visit. Um, also, for anyone, whether you're a guest with us or, uh, or have been coming here the longest, um, you can also use that little section on your bulletin for a prayer request. You can put your prayer request on there, tear it off, put it in a little church house. Our pastor collects those each week and prays for us during the week. And it just blesses my socks off, y'all, that he does that for us. And I know a lot of pastors do that, but it's just so intentional, and it really is a great example for us that he prays for us and that we also should be praying for each other, how powerful prayer can be. So um, welcome to those of you also joining us online. Um, we're glad that you're here with us either live or um, if you're watching this later. So welcome is all I'm trying to say. It's a big, big welcome. Um, a few things I would like to tell you about. One is if you are uh, wanting to know how to share your tithes and offering, there are a few ways you can do that. One is you can place that in the little boxes that are on the wall. There's two of them in here. They're little white boxes on the wall that say tithe. And there are also a couple of boxes out in the foyer that are on a stand. Um, you can place it there. That's one way. Um, you can also get online and share that way through our website. And then the third way is by texting, and that's you can text 84321 for your tithe. So there's a few ways you can do that. It's up there on the screen. And if you forget or don't have this, I think it's also in your bulletin. But if not, just, just track one of us down. I mean, don't tackle us or anything, but, you know, stop us nicely without hurting us. And ask us how, because we would love to show you how to do that. All right. Uh, let's see. What else can I tell you about? We've got several things coming up. Um, this is exciting for the ladies. They're going to start having, um, I don't know that it's going to be every Monday, but I know we are having one. This is in your bulletin, upcoming event on Monday, December 5th, 1130 to 1230. There's going to be a uh, ladies' luncheon, and I know that they're planning to maybe do some various ones this week. Is gonna, this is tomorrow, December 5th. <laughs> it's already December. Oh, my goodness. Okay, a little anxiety there for just a little quick second. It's gone now. Um, bum, do bum doolers is where they're going to meet. So if you would like to um, just gather with some of the other ladies in our church, um, that's going to be tomorrow, Monday, 1130 to 1230. On Wednesday night, we have prayer meetings and Bible study that is still going on, 6 o'clock for prayer and then 630. And that's, um, I believe that's next door in the building next door. No? Oh, thank you. Thank you. See, this is a team effort. Y'all think I do the announcements, but really, we are doing the announcements. So thank you for that. It's not next door. It's back here. <laughs> and Jane's over there pointing to Y'all, I love this. It's major team. Teamwork, dream work. Woo, woo. Okay. So back here in this room on Wednesdays for prayer and Bible study. All right. Nobody else is flagging me down. But we do have also some youth activities coming up. Uh, Wednesday, December 21st is the ice skating and youth Christmas party. Meeting at the church here, 3.30, and pick up at 9 p.m., $15 for ice skating and a white elephant gift for a gift exchange. Dinner is going to be provided. That sounds really fun. So if you um, are a youth, please come. If you have a youth or know a youth, please invite them and invite your friends. The more the merrier, especially on those gift exchanges. Those are really fun. So that sounds like a good time. All right, a couple of other things in here um, you can read for yourself. I won't go through them all, but if this is one way to get some uh, some announcements of things that are coming up. So please, if you didn't get one, get one before you leave today so you can have that for the week and to mark your calendars. All right, let's see. I think that I've covered it all um, before. 
we go into our children's sermon, would you guys just please uh, say hello to the people around you, tell them that you're glad they're, that they're here, give them a big smile, a wave, a hug if that's okay, and we'll um, have the children come up. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, Pastor Joe. Jack, can you make sure that video, that song is about ready to play? Um, do y'all see what my little grandson here is wearing? Uh, uh, a destruction helmet. A what? Destruction helmet? Uh huh. Construction, destruction, they do it both, don't they? Yeah, and, and that's what you do you know why when you're working in construction you're supposed to be wearing a hat like this? Why? To protect yourself. To protect yourself because sometimes somebody that's working above you might drop a hammer or a brick. So you always want to make sure if you're working in a construction zone that you've got your head. Yeah, these are just plastic. Yeah, these are just yeah. plastic. And then have you ever seen some, have you ever seen somebody wearing one of these? Yes. Yes, yes. He does? What does your dad do? Um, he works at, in um, Las Vegas, and he works to help other people. He works to help other people in Las Vegas? Uh-huh. He warns them what places not to go into, I bet. Uh-huh. Yes. Mine is this kindness video, Life Possessed. Uh-huh. In the end of this beginning and the end of it, where this this worker at help build stuff is helping this boy get up because he he falls and and wrap it up a little bit you know kind of get to the end of your story and then at the end of it he helps he gets water because at, at before that but does he wear a vest like this and he helps people and he kind of warns people and and you also wear a vest like this so yes Your dad works at the military. Does he have to wear a vest like this or a Kevlar vest? Uh, he wears kind of guard shirt. Okay, Army uniform. Well, that's great. Well, we, when you're in a construction site, yes, ma'am? Somebody at my school named Mr. Bondo wears one of these. Two. Someone at your school? Sign. And a stop sign? Yeah, so when a kid is trying to cross the road, he stop, he hold, he's wearing this and holding up the sign. Awesome, awesome. Well, you know, the Bible talks about how not only, you know, there are areas of construction, but there's an area the Bible talks about being under construction, and it's our heart and our thoughts and the way we act is all under construction. Now, when you're building something, it doesn't start off in the, in the end result. Like when I asked you to get to the end, you were kind of building in a long kind of story to kind of build something. You always are building something, and God is building what? He's building us. And there's a song that is, is a, a cute little song. And I, you know, like Lindy said, this is everybody. It's not just the children, and we're going to need your help. Um, it's called I Am a Promise, and it's, it's about, and it's just 30 seconds of it, about what God is doing with us, because he's building. Okay, let's play the video. Let's see if we can all... ...over a long period, and it's going to be great. I'm a promise, possibility, do y'all know it? With a capital P, great big bundle of poten potentiality. Come on, help me if y'all know it, because it's not on the words. To hear God's voice, and I am trying the right choice. A great big 
God wants me to be. Okay, that's great. Thank you all. Thank you, boys and girls. Y'all can go to Children's Church. Oh, Lord, help us grow to be the children. Let these children grow to be the children that you want them to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, this way. From wherever you've been, come broken hearted, let a rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't hear. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't hear.
And all those who've strayed, come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. So lay down your for head knowledge, Lord, that you would just really penetrate to our spirit, that you would help us to take your message through Pastor Joe into our own lives, to apply it to our lives, not just for ourselves, Lord, to become more like you, but also to shine the light out to the world, to our hurting, broken world. Help us to always remember that, that you love us all. And I just thank you so much, most of all, for your son, Jesus, and what you did by reconciling us back to you through him, Lord. And I just ask this in his precious, precious, precious name, Jesus. Amen. Good morning again. As you can tell by the communion table in front of me, at the end of the service, we are going to take communion if you would like to. Uh, we will close the service and take a short break and get as close to the middle as possible and then have communion. If you have uh, an appointment you need to get to or meeting someone and you don't want to stay a little bit longer, we perfectly understand. 
if you are worshiping with us online, then we're going to give, as I said, we'll take a short break and you can grab some um, juice and a piece of bread or a cracker and take communion from home along with us. Would you bow your heads and pray with me, please? And I'm going to ask you to do something. First, I want you to just pray a prayer of, of worship and adoration to your Heavenly Father and for all that He has done for you. Now, if you would, pray that God would speak to you today. Our dear Heavenly Father, we love you and we worship you and we thank you. You're an awesome God. You do bless us all the time. Father, Sunday mornings are so important for me and for all of us because it, it gives us a chance to, to quit being so busy and chasing different things and responsibilities and to come into your presence and pause and worship you and exalt your name. Father, we know that we need your Holy Spirit to be with us, to be within us, to fill us. We pray, Father, that as a result of hearing your word today, that we can be better disciples. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, the title of today's message is Under Construction. We've got two little uh, under construction signs. The first one here, um, <clears throat> you've probably seen this in many, many different places. And then here's another version of it, which I like better. Now, if I were designing this sign for highway construction, I would put about four guys behind this person <laughs> watching. I guess you've noticed that before. But, you know, everybody can't, you know, use the shovel at the same time. You've got to take turns. Um, as I looked into the scriptures to find out what the Bible teaches about being under construction and building, there are over 60 passages in the Bible that talk about that. I picked five of them this morning that I want to emphasize. They will be up on the screen. Please read along with me out loud the highlighted portions. In Matthew 7, 24, Jesus is teaching a crowd. And it's, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 7, verse 24, Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. I'm going to read these five passages of Scripture, and then I want to come back and elaborate on, on them just a little bit. In Luke chapter 14, verse 28, it says, Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? Hebrews 3, 4 says this, For every house is built by someone. But God is the builder of everything. Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. And then Proverbs 24, 3 and 4 says, By wisdom a house is built, and through understanding it is established. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. If you were just to take this at surface level, you might say that Jesus was putting on seminars about how to build buildings. But you know that's not true. What Jesus is doing is he's using the concept of building to talk about how to build a life. Now... <clears throat> In the first passage, Matthew 7, 24, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount with a whole crowd of people listening, he says, everybody who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise person who built his house on the rock. So what Jesus is saying is you would be wise 
if you put into practice what he is teaching us. And then if you do, you will find that your life has been built upon something solid, something that will not sink in shifting sands. I want to suggest to you that we are living in a culture of shifting sands. Those of you who are older, like me, you can look back and remember all the different things that have shifted in our culture over the last many years. There are some things that would be perfectly okay to say 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that now folks will tell you, don't say that. It's not politically correct. Now, we homeschooled up until uh, middle school. And because most homeschoolers require one spouse to stay home, you're buying uh, textbooks and school things on a very low budget. I remember buying a used globe so that we could teach our children where these different countries were that I had never even heard of. And you could spin the globe, put your finger down, and try to pronounce the country. Well, <clears throat> it was an older globe, meaning that things have changed since that globe, that good-priced yard sale globe, and so, you know, you just start saying things that we had said for many, many years, such as, these people are called Oriental because they're from the Orient. And yet, I was told, Dad, you can't say Oriental anymore. Why not? They don't want to be called Oriental. They want to be called Asian. And all of a sudden, I'm at a loss. And so one of our part-time worship leaders years ago was a man by the name of Jeffrey, and he had married the daughter of a uh, missionary. And... <clears throat> And by the way, it's still politically correct to call us Texans if you're from Texas. N nothing offensive intended, right? Correct. And if you're from California, you can be called Californians. And if you're from other places, I don't know what they call you. But so when Jeffrey was engaged to this very attractive young lady, I remember someone asking me if she was... Um, what her genealogy was or what her background was. And I made the mistake of saying she's Oriental. And I was told, Dad, you can't say that. Well, there was nothing offensive intended. So I asked my administrative assistant, Betty Jones, who's gone on to be with the Lord, her husband and daughter and son-in-law are here. Um, she was sick and she couldn't write the check that weekend. So I said in front of my children, I said, Jeffrey, if you'll tell me the address that you, because he drove all the way from San Angelo. I said, if you'll tell me your address, I'll write the check and just send it to you. He said, we live on 768 Oriental Express. I couldn't help but feel justified. <laughs> but everybody is changing things through the culture because culture changes over and over and over. You follow me? Yeah. What was accepted as bedrock 20 years ago is now being taught in liberal universities as completely the opposite. So, what this passage is saying is, Jesus said, if you build your life on a rock, it is strong and steadfast, and it will not shift from out from underneath you. 
Culture is always shifting, but the principles of God's Word are steadfast and secure. Amen. Then in the next passage, he says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Aren't you going to first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? I don't think Jesus was trying to encourage everybody to go home and build a tower. No, I think what he was saying was, you got to make sure you have what it takes to get the job of life done. And then in Hebrews chapter 3, he says, every house is built by somebody, but God must be the builder of everything. And then in Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds your life or your house, those who build it labor in vain. Have you ever known someone that has built their life and it turned out to be in vain and it collapsed because it was not built upon something secure and steadfast? Can I get a little feedback from you this morning? Do you know anybody that has built? Have you ever looked back and said, that part of my life was not built on the foundation that it needed to be built on? And then the last one, Proverbs 24. I love this passage. By wisdom a house is built, through understanding it is established and through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. And this tells us several things. First of all, if you are going to have a home built, a physical home, you hope that your contractor has got a little bit of wisdom and a great deal of knowledge. You wouldn't want him to put a door where there should have been a window or have your your door not open correctly. You want him to have a little bit of experience and a little bit of knowledge. But when it comes to building your life, if you can have some knowledge and wisdom and understanding, how much better off are you going to be? And then he says this. He says, through knowledge, the rooms are filled with rare and valuable things. Now think about this. How would you like to have a life that was filled with rare and valuable blessings. You just got to build it right. So Jesus is teaching us how to build a life. Now, when he is the master teacher, the teaching style of the Middle East back then is totally, and it still is, is totally different than the Western style. When Greek philosophers kind of took over the education mindset, it swept over Europe and it came over to America. And the primary way that the West teaches is in a lecture environment. Y'all are all the students, bring out your notepads, take notes, and there will be a test over this material in a few weeks. And so the teacher lectures and the students listen. And then at some point in the future, they regurgitate what they wrote or what they heard. We've all been a part of that style, right? And most of us learn somewhere along the way that you can cram right before a test, take the test, and then after you finish the test, you can go to sleep and forget it all. And you pray that there will not be an in-term test that requires you to remember all the other stuff. And there are some things that build upon each thing. You, you can't learn eighth grade math until you've learned sixth grade math. They all build upon each other. But the Middle East and the Eastern style of teaching is totally different. What the Eastern style is, is you would have a, usually a traveling teacher. And the traveling teacher would, would demonstrate what he wants his students to learn. And first, the first principle was, you follow me and watch. Observe what I do. And then you will start to do some things while I observe what you do. And I will comment and correct and criticize what you've done so that you can do it better next time. And then you get to the point where you can do it and you don't even know if the master is watching anymore. 
And then finally you get to the point where you are so much like your master teacher that people will ask you, who is your teacher? Who are you the disciple of? Because they will notice that you are so much like your teacher that you've got a common style. And that's the Eastern teaching method. A couple of weeks ago, I, made a, I preached a sermon on how your crutch can become a weapon. And the point of that message, if you didn't hear it, the point of the message was sometimes we are wounded in life and sometimes we need a crutch. Sometimes bad experiences happen and we are heartbroken and we struggle. And we can let that crippling situation keep us down discourage us, immobilize us, or we can learn a lesson about God and about ourselves, and we will claim some promises that in all things God will work together for good, and that there can be something good coming out of every situation if we look for it and if we have faith. But this is something that is not learned in a classroom. This is learned by experience. Now, I want to ask you all a question right now. It's not a trick question. I just want to ask you, would you consider yourself, and if, if the answer is yes, I want you to raise your hand, please. Would you consider yourself a Christ follower? Raise your hand. Awesome. Now, I set you up a little bit because Jesus in Mark chapter 1, is walking beside the Sea of Galilee, and he is just now starting to recruit disciples. A disciple is from the root word of discipleship or discipline. And so when somebody says, I wish you would discipline your children, most of the older folks think that means spank them. But actually what it literally means is train them. You can train them through spanking, or you can train them through time out. You can train a child in many different ways. But if you are training them, you are making them your disciples, so to speak. So Jesus is just now starting to gather his disciples. He's walking beside the Sea of Galilee, and he sees Simon Peter, and he sees his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Read it with me. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. I asked you, are you a Christ follower? Most everyone said yes. So let me ask you, how well are you fishing for men? You see, because Jesus said, if you follow me, I will make you someone who fishes for others. So would it be safe to say that all of us have not arrived yet in our, in our end goal? You know, in karate and martial arts, they give belts to kind of let you know it. You know, you've got the white belt, and the white belt is really clean and white and pure, and that means you haven't been in enough fights yet. A black belt... It, that whole idea came because it started off white. You didn't change a belt. It just got so dirty through fighting that it became a black belt. And so the concept is, is in the process, you are becoming more skilled and a better student of your teacher. So a few people asked me a couple of weeks ago, what discipline did you study in martial arts? Because there are, oh, at least 10, at least 10 different disciplines of martial arts. There is uh, MMA, which stands for Mixed Martial Arts. I studied boxing in high school. And then there is karate, and, and my style was called combat karate. There is Kempo, and there is Taekwondo, and there are all these different disciplines. Once you know what the discipline is, you would then say, who is your sensei? Sensei is a fancy Japanese word, which means your teacher. And so everybody would have a teacher. And this concept was in the day of Jesus Christ because the Apostle Paul was defending his background by saying, not only was I a Pharisee among Pharisees, but I studied under, 
You all know his name? Gamaliel. Gamaliel was on the Sanhedrin, and he was renowned by all. So Paul was a student or a disciple underneath Gamaliel until he had his Damascus Road experience. And he shifted from Gamaliel to the Lord Jesus, and he became a student of the Lord Jesus. Now, <clears throat> when you are learning by doing, it just, it just pays off in so many ways. One of the things that I remember my sensei teaching me was, in teaching the whole class, was that the attacks on the head. You can say, that sounds bad. You're defending yourself. So attacks to the head. He said, wherever you take their head, the body will follow. And so then he would demonstrate how you could grab an opponent's head and do a twist or a flip, and their body could not help but come along for the ride. Well, Josh and I were invited by one of our church members years ago to go up to Alaska on a moose hunt and a bear hunt. I didn't see any bear, so lots of evidence, but we did see a couple of moose. One of the guys, his name was Henry, he shot this moose, and it was about a 700-pound animal. Well, if you know anything about field dressing an animal, you've got to turn it over on its back. Josh is all, twice as strong as me. Henry was twice as strong in his own mind. And so they, um, that was supposed to be funny. So uh, <clears throat> they were trying to turn this moose over on its back and a 700 pound moose just wouldn't go. So I said, step back boys. I took the antlers and I just twisted the antlers and the body goes bloop. Did it all by myself. I was so proud. <clears throat> so the point is the teacher said look for the head. The body will always follow the head. And I could not help but think about the scripture that says Jesus is the head of the church. Look to the head. Where the head goes, the body should go. So that's just a side little teaching I won't charge you for. So um, folks would ask me, who is my senpai? Uh, I'm sorry, sensei. I said senpai because my sensei when he could not come to class, and I had the highest belt among the students at the time, he said to the class, he said, I will not be here next Wednesday, but Pastor Taylor will be your simpe. What that means is he's my assistant. In that moment, they should regard me just like a sensei. And so I, when he first said I was the simpe, I'd never heard of that. I didn't know if he was insulting me or not, and I had to go and look it up. But the idea is, is that the simpe is the second in command, and this is all from Middle East or Eastern education. It doesn't just apply to martial arts. And this is what I learned. I learned that simpe means the assistant who steps into the role of the master teacher when required. I listened to a Jewish pastor who had been born again and came into the kingdom of God, and he was teaching about a passage of scripture, and then he spoke and taught us something I had never heard before in the Western seminaries. And I want to read that passage to you real quickly. Now remember, Middle East teaching methods is I call you to follow me. You are expected to watch me and learn from observation. Then you will start to do what I do. And I will watch you from observation. I will criticize you and make suggestions to you so that you can be better at what I am calling you to do. You got that? Okay. In Matthew 14, it says, As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. 
Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. Read it with me. You give them something to eat. You've already watched me. You give them something to eat. And then they say, well, we've only got five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus said, well, bring them to me. In verse 19, he directs the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven. See, he's modeling now. He's having them watch. He gives thanks and he breaks the loaves. Then he gives them to the disciples and the disciples give them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Now the number of those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Well, during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then Peter answers, Lord, if it's you, read it with me, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Peter gets down out of the boat, walks on the water, and comes toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So this Jewish pastor said that because this is a Middle East or an Eastern style of education, you've got the master teacher Jesus and his simpe, his assistant, who is so supposed to watch the master, and whatever the master does, his assistant must do. And so when Jesus is walking on the water and they're all afraid, and Jesus says, don't be afraid, it's me, Peter probably says, well, if it's you, he knows that it's his responsibility to do what the master is doing because he's watching his master. Now, if it were you or me, we probably would rather stay in the boat as rocky as it was rather than to get out of the boat and walk out to Jesus. Now, maybe Peter knew that it was safer to be with Jesus on the water than to be with the other disciples in the boat. But nonetheless, this Jewish pastor said it was the expected responsibility that the simpe do what the sensei was doing. That made me think of two other passages of Scripture that Jesus said in John chapter 8 and then also in John chapter 10. Jesus is teaching the crowd who is questioning who he is. And he says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. And then in John 10, he says, don't believe me unless I do what my Father does. You see, Jesus did not speak and did not act and did not do unless he felt his Father leading him to speak those things and to do those things. This is why Jesus was so close to his Father, because they were so close, they were one. And what Jesus wants his disciples to do 
is to look and see where God is moving and working and join him. What Jesus wants his disciples to do is quit just sitting and start partnering. Now, I don't know which college you might have gone to if you went to college. You know, a lot of folks don't go to college because they don't learn well from the Western style of memorizing and regurgitating. They learn better by doing, and that's the, the Eastern method. But even in the Western colleges, there is a option called auditing a class. I don't know if any of you have ever audited a class before, but there is a difference, a distinct difference. Now, there are some benefits and there are some detriments. If you audit a class, you can go every class day and listen to your professor lecture and teach, just like everybody else. But you don't have to take the tests. You don't have to write the papers. You just have to show up when you want to show up. And if halfway through you wanted to just sleep in, you could do that. And so a lot of folks want to audit a class. But here's the problem. You don't take the tests. Therefore, you don't learn as much. You're not required to get out of your comfort zone. And the worst thing is you pay for the class just like everyone else, but you don't take, you don't get any credit. It won't show up on your transcript. You won't get the benefit. And I want to suggest to you that most churches across America are filled, as John MacArthur would say, with placid piles of impotent, impotent it's hard to say, Placid piles of impotent, unproductive pusters that are just auditing. They're not really following. They don't have the mindset, I'm a disciple. I want to learn. You see, when you're sitting there and Professor or Preacher Miyagi says, wax on or wax off, you're thinking, I could have stayed home today. And you don't understand you're just sitting watching somebody else wax on and wax off. In fact, you can come to church on a Sunday and just listen to the music as if it's just on your radio. Or you can participate and you can actually worship and you can come into the presence of God and you can be transformed. Now, there is a passage, I made an allusion to it a couple of weeks ago in my last sermon. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Apostle Paul is teaching this. <clears throat> this might have happened when the Apostle Paul was stoned and left for dead. We don't know for sure, but that's my own opinion. Sometime he had a vision of going into heaven. It could have been a near-death experience. We don't know. But he goes into the presence of God, and I want to show and share and read to you what he says about it. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it's not on the screen, just listen. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ, he's talking about himself, he's trying to be humble in the way he presents it. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Now, if that confuses you, the first heaven is the air that we breathe and where the birds fly. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is where the stars are. The third heaven in Jewish literature and language is where the angels and God is. So he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. <clears throat> Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. And I know this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. 
And then in verse 7, he says, to keep me, now listen very carefully, to keep me from being coming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest in me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I'll delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. So, the Apostle Paul said... To keep me from becoming conceited. Who wanted to keep Paul from being conceited? Think about it. Who wanted to keep Paul from becoming conceited? Say it louder. God did. God God was trying to keep Paul from becoming conceited. But then read the next part. To keep me from becoming conceited... Because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. So who wanted to torment him? Satan. Who gave him the thorn? It doesn't say. All it says is there was given to me a thorn. And he says that thorn was given to me to keep me from becoming conceited. That thorn was given to me to buffet me and to keep me down and low. You all have received thorns this year. Every one of us have got thorn wounds in our heart and in our soul and mind. Who gave you those thorns? I don't know. But those thorns can be used by God... Or those thorns can also be used by Satan to knock you out and to keep you down. You see, bad things and tribulations happen to all of us. And I pray that you will learn the lesson of how to take a storm and to turn it into walking on water. I pray and hope that you will learn the lesson of how to take a heart wound and to turn it into a reason to give God glory and to bring comfort to others who have your same heart wound. You see, you are a disciple if you are a Christ follower. And this is not a lecture class. This is an opportunity to interact with the Spirit of God and allow Him, right where you are, whether here or online, To let God take your wound and make it a weapon. To snatch the victory away from Satan and to bring the victory to the kingdom. You must participate in that process. Oh, I've seen so many times where a heart wound or a hurt or an insult has just taken people out of serving God. I'll never go back to that church again. The preacher didn't even shake my hand. I've heard where so many folks have been serving God and then they were criticized. And they're not going to do that anymore. I tell you, we are so wimpy in our faith that when God says wax on, wax off, we don't want to do that. When Satan throws his arrows, they hit hard because we never took the time to wax on and wax off. What we want to do is we want to turn Christianity into a bottle of comfort that will just soothe our owies and our boo-boos. Because what we want out of Christianity is something that will just make us feel better. I tell you what Jesus said, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. He says, you feed the 5,000 while I watch. He turned to Peter and he said, where's your faith? You were starting to walk on water. 
And then when Jesus left, it was Peter who preached to the 5,000. Every one of them lived their faith in spite of the persecutions. Church family, I don't know what the future holds. But if we read the Bible in Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation, we know that at some point, things are going to continue to get really, really difficult, even and especially those who say they are Christ followers. I know some people who go to church, and as soon as things go bad in their life, they get angry with God and they say, why should I follow him? I prayed and it didn't work. Well, of course prayers don't work. It's God who works through your prayers. Why'd you quit so early? Where is your faith? Church family, God is looking for a people. Belt. God is looking for a people that he can say, these people are my simpes. They fight like me. They love like me. They work like me. In fact, so much so that others will look at them and say, I bet I know who your teacher is. So church family, I'm going to ask you, are you willing to say, I'm going to sign up to be a Christ follower no matter what the lesson requires, and I'm not going to audit the class. I want credit. Would you stand with me and bow your heads? Father, I pray that when others see the way we handle pressure, that when others see the way that we handle insults and inconveniences and difficulties, they will be able to say, your sensei must be Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. I want to sign up and be a part of your class because you live by faith and I don't even know how. Father, I pray that other folks would want to be on the hook of the gospel of Christ because we have learned how to be fishers of men. Father, help us to open our mouths and tell other people how good God is. Help us, Father, go into our prayer closet and pray for others. Father, may your kingdom come and your will be done right here on earth, just like you do in heaven. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have prayer partners around the back wall if you would like to go and pray with some of our prayer partners. But I want to encourage you to worship through this next song. Put your whole heart into it. Don't just have your lips go through the motions. But we are going into the presence of God. Sought 
to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died praise the Father praise the Son praise the Spirit three in one God of glory majesty praise forever to the King of Kings. In the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath, till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, resurrected me I think every one of us could look back over this year and say that we have gone through some difficult times, uh, had some heart wounds or some losses, uh, the death of some family members. Um, turn your hurt into a victory. Use it as a weapon against Satan by bringing praise and glory to no matter what he throws at you. Become a true follower of Christ. Father, in Jesus' name, we look to you because you are the builder of our lives. And if we try to build our own lives, we build it in vain. Lord, we know that when we build our lives upon the rock, that you will give us wisdom and knowledge. And that wisdom and knowledge could bring such valuable things into our relationships and into our lives. We praise you that you are such an awesome God. We pray, Father, that even though we look at our circumstances and start to sink in the waves of life, you still reach out your hand to us and encourage us to take your hand and get us back onto a solid foundation. Lord, we praise you. We love you. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fill each and every person here. I pray, Father, that each and every person here will grow in their walk in life with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to take a short break. If you need to use the restroom um, or if you've got other appointments, we understand. But if you could come down from the balcony and all of us sit down. And then over here on these tables, we have a table on this wall and this wall. We've got an individual serving of communion. Please grab one of those during the break and come in and join us for communion. Praise the
I assume everyone has uh, their communion cup. Just a little instruction. There is, um, these are COVID friendly, so we're not passing an offering plate. Um, but uh, there's a wafer on one side and there's juice on the other. When you have the wafer on the top, that's the one we'll take off first. It'd be messy if you take the one off the bottom before it's ready. All right. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of coming and worshiping you and being in your presence. Father, we know that this is a, uh, an act of worship in itself to remember all that you've done for us. We pray, Father, that it will be done very meaningfully, a sense of sacredness, as we stand in awe or sit in awe, as we just worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus gathered his disciples in the upper room on the night before he was betrayed. He wanted to make sure that they took the Passover meal together one last time, but he also wanted to use it as a teaching. Passover was done once a year. It was always the time when a lamb would be sacrificed for the sins of the people. Jesus took the bread. And just in a few chapters earlier, he had told his followers he said this is my body in the upper room Jesus said the same thing he said this is my body which is given for you now in the King James I'm just going to teach a little bit in the King James it says broken for you that's not an accurate translation because Jesus' body was never broken the Bible says not a bone was broken in the crucifixion of Jesus. So we've learned through the years to try to change our statement rather than say this is my body broken for you, it was this is my body given for you. As you look at this piece of bread, it has no leaven in it, and it's not puffed up like a, a yeast roll, it's, it's got no leaven. And that was typical of the Passover meal because Leaven oftentimes in the Bible represented sin. And right before Passover, God's people were told to get all the leaven out of their homes. And so the leaven being gone, the sin being gone, Jesus said, this is my body given for you. Take it in remembrance of me. Rodney, in a loud voice, would you mind standing and thanking God for the body which he gave for us? Father, we're humbled to come into your presence today and recognize your presence with us. Thank you for this reminder. The sacrifice that was made on the cross of Calvary for our sins. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Rodney. The Jewish Passover consisted of four different times that it was a teaching time to teach the family and to remember all that God had done for the Israelites. There was a cup that would be filled with wine um, four times, and each time they drank it, it was considered a different cup, although it was often in the same cup, it just had four different fillings. And the first cup in the Passover represented God's 
praise, praise to God, how awesome he is, how wonderful he is. The second cup was a time to teach the family about his judgments. And it referred back to the Exodus when God used the uh, 10 plagues to judge Egypt in the same way God will judge our sins. That was the second cup. First cup is praise, second cup is judgment. The third cup was known as the cup of salvation. So when Jesus took that third cup and he looked at his followers, he said, this cup is my blood shed for you. What he was saying is, my blood is your salvation. My death is your hope. He wanted to prepare them and he wanted them to remember every time they cook, took communion that the cup of salvation represented the blood of Jesus. On the night that he was betrayed, he took that cup and he said, drink it in remembrance of me. Well, Father, we have just taken, partaken, a portion of the Passover meal which you instituted. Lord, that points us to you and to your holiness, that reminds us of the sin in our life that needs to be judged. But then, Lord, makes us so thankful that Jesus took that judgment on our behalf and paid the price. He paid a debt that he did not owe. We owed a debt that we couldn't pay. We needed him to wash our blood away, our wash our sins away. Lord, thank you that Jesus did that for us. Would you close with me now, church family, in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You're dismissed. There is some... Uh, trash cans on the way out that you can put your, your uh, empty cup in. Thank you so much for coming today.